time around 7.30, uh, which means it's time to look at some more radiographs. Uh, welcome everyone who's joined us this evening for the August 2021 film reading session from London Veterinary Specialists. Just before we get into the cases, a very quick introduction for those of you who are new to these sessions. My name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. Um, I graduated from the RBC way back in 2004. I got my RCVS certificate in veterinary diagnostic imaging in 2009 and then went back to the RVC in 2013 to do my imaging residency. Um, I got my diploma in 2018 and these days you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in central London and if you have any questions about anything imaging related if you need a hand interpreting some radiographs or if you'd like to have a chat about what imaging modality might be most useful for a patient that you're working up then you can drop me a line via email or give me a call at the clinic on this number. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we are pretty thin on the ground in terms of numbers this evening so uh, unless we get some more delegates um, I'm not going to activate the poll everywhere questions but just in case we do for those of you who've never used poll everywhere it's a way to uh, get involved in the session without actually reporting a case um, i'm hoping that those of you that are in attendance are going to report um, and so we're not going to have to rely on the fancy online polling software but if we do decide to use it um, the way to do that is to go to poll ev.com and to type in my username which is Ian David Juni 636 and at various points during the presentation you should see a question pop up um, you need to respond um, and then hopefully if everything's working and I sync it up um, the responses should magically appear on my PowerPoint presentation. So uh, before we get into uh, the first case of the evening, we'll just take a look at an example. Now uh, this is a case that we reviewed uh, during um, June's film reading session and I promised that we would revisit it because it was quite unusual. It's a two-year-old male neutered medium crossbreed dog that's presented to you as dyspneic. Um, now we're only going to look at uh, one film because this is an example. Um, in the original presentation there were three films um, but today we've just got the left lateral view of the thorax. Um, hopefully you guys can appreciate that um, this doggy's thorax uh, contains uh, a whole bunch of poorly marginated soft tissue nodules and these nodules are so big and so numerous um, that at various points within the thorax um, they're coalescing and um, creating um, a more uniform soft tissue opacity. Uh, now, the rest of this radiograph is, is pretty unremarkable. Um, it's very difficult to assess the cardiac silhouette and the pulmonary vasculature because all of those structures are um, superimposed and um, obscured by all of these soft tissue modules. Um, the mediastinum, at least in this single view, looks uh, pretty normal. And if I remember rightly, the DVV, DV view that we had of this patient, the mediastinum also looked uh, normal. Um, and all of the exothoracic structures, including the thoracic vertebra, the sternogra, the ribs, all look absolutely fine. Um, in terms of um, other radiographic features and um, radiographic descriptive terms, you might think about including the report here. Um, we already mentioned the fact that it's difficult to see the cardiac silhouette. So you could potentially say that the margins are effaced by these soft tissue modules, um, and that would also be true for the margins of the diaphragm. So it's quite difficult to make out the margins of the diaphragmatic crua here. Now, that isn't because this patient has uh, anything like um, a diaphragmatic um, hernia. It's just we've got soft tissue in terms of the soft tissue nodules up against soft tissue, soft tissue of the liver. So the opacity is the same. So it's impossible for us to make out the boundary between them. Now, the reason why I include this as an example is because uh, when uh, we had this patient uh, on clinics, um, we were very suspicious uh, that this dog might have lung wound. And the reason for that is because this is a two-year-old dog, so um, a 12-year-old dog uh, presenting dyspneic and um, having a, a series of thoracic radiographs containing multiple soft tissue nodules, we immediately start thinking about something sinister um, like uh, metastatic neoplasia. But in a two-year-old dog, you really have to consider other potential differentials. Uh, so something infectious, um, something inflammatory, um, something 
parasitic maybe. Um, so the differentials we came up with were um, things like, well, has this dog been abroad? Because if so, this could potentially be um, a fungal pneumonia. Um, so um, dogs uh, from the States, um, there are a couple of fungal organisms um, like uh, coccidia mycosis, blastomycosis, there's also histoplasmosis that can cause um, soft tissue nodules within the pulmonary parenchyma. Um, so that was the first thing we considered, and this dog has never been born, always lived in the UK, uh, which makes something like a fungal pneumonia um, less likely. Um, in terms of other types of infectious disease, um, it, it, this doesn't really look like a bacterial pneumonia. You don't tend to see soft tissue nodules with um, a bacterial pneumonia. The, the only thing really in this country that would do it um, commonly, and it's not something that you see very often, would be something like TB. So cats with tuberculosis, they can have soft tissue nodules in their lungs, but this isn't a cat. Um, and, and it would be really unusual um, for um, something like uh, TB to present like this, um, this sort of patient, this kind of signal. So that's really unlikely. Could it be something inflammatory? So could this patient have something like inflammatory eosinophilic granulomatosis, which is um, a primary inflammatory condition, which can cause nodules and masses within the pulmonary parenchyma? It could do. Um, again, usually you tend to get fewer, larger masses um, than we're seeing here. Here we've got multiple soft tissue nodules, um, but you can't rule it out. Um, something primary inflammatory, inflammatory like eosinophilic um, granulomatosis is definitely on the list. Um, could it be parasitic? So could this be lung wound? Um, and again, the distribution and the types, the type of change that we're seeing here wouldn't be typical for lung worm. So lung worm normally um, you're going to see uh, you're going to see an increase in opacity around the periphery of, of the lung, and you tend not to see nodules. Um, and here the change is, is diffuse, so all of the pulmonary parenchyma is affected, and um, the most pertinent radiographic change is the presence of these soft tissue nodules. So that doesn't really fit with lung wound either. Um, however, uh, we um, did manage to take an impression smear of this unfortunate patient's lung tissue um, just after um, he was euthanized, and um, at the time we were suspicious that we might be able to see a little larval organism on that impression smear. So lung worm um, was uh, our top differential, as atypical as it seemed to be at that time. And now uh, I absolutely agree that, that this isn't typical for lung worm, and um, there was certainly um, some doubt uh, amongst the delegates as to how likely it was that this patient uh, had lung worm. So um, we got the full PM report back, and in fact, it, isn't lung worm, this patient. Um, this this two-year-old dog was unfortunate enough to have a highly aggressive brown cell neoplasm. And not only that, but the this neoplasia, this aggressive brown cell neoplasia, was not only affecting the lung and responsible for all of these soft tissue nodules that we can see in the pulmonary parenchyma, um, but also um, the pleura and the right atrium. And so it's a small mass protruding into this dog's right atrium. Lumen. Um, didn't have lung wound, um, so I'm not sure what we saw there with pressure smith, um, but um, did have neoplasia despite the fact that um, it was only two years old. Um, so, yeah, the final diagnosis in this unfortunate beast um, was a highly aggressive round cell neoplasm affecting the right atrium, the uh, pleura, and the pulmonary parenchyma. So, yeah, that's uh, the update on uh, that case that we reviewed uh, way back in, in June. So there we go, that's case number one. That's just in case you guys need reminding of how to join in the session using Poll Everywhere. Um, so PoolEV.com, Ian David Journey 636, and then respond to the activity. Though, like I say, I'm probably not going to use it this evening because we've not got too many delegates attending. So we're not going to test it. And we're going to go straight on to case number one. So case number one is a six-year-old female neutered greyhound um, that has a left fallen lameness. Um, so uh, we've got some uh, medial-lateral radiographs of the shoulders here. Um, we've got the right shoulder, we've got the left shoulder, and we've got the right and the left shoulders together. Um, so um, there aren't too many of you, um, but which of you feels like they might want to walk us through um, case number one? So this is uh, the first of uh, the orthopedic cases that we want to have a chat about this evening, at least one. Hi Ian, I, I don't mind getting started. Yeah, thanks Roger, go for it. Um, so we've got a single medial view of the scapular humeral joints in a lately mature dog. Um, just cranial to the greater cubicle of the humerus, there's a single well-marginated um, web shape and bone structure. 
um, with relatively smooth margins, um, which I believe is likely to represent an enthesiophyte. Um, I think there's a small amount of subchondral bone sclerosis associated with the greater tubercle. Um, just caudal to the enthesiophyte, um, superimposed over the bicipital groove, um, there's a focal, well marginated um, rectangular area of mineralization, um, which, given its location, I think is likely to represent a chronic tendinopathy. Um, I think because the supraspinatus tendon attaches on the greater tubercle, um, the enthesiophyte made me think that it's more likely to be an issue with the supraspinatus. Okay. Um, but the location of the mineralization, I think, is more consistent with the biceps brachii tendon. Um, so I'm not entirely sure which of the two it could be. Um, they're both kind of top of my differential list. So I'm inclined to go with biceps brachii. Okay. Um, for another differential, I don't think this is very likely at all, but um, I think the transverse humeral ligament is in that location as well. So potentially a lesion associated with that. Um, but my next step would be um, a kind of specialist ultrasound with potential arthroscopy or advanced imaging for potential surgery for a tendinopathy. Okay, yeah, no, um, absolutely. Um, great description. Um, so uh, that was a very nice summary of what's going on in the left shoulder. Are you happy that the right shoulder is normal? I was, but I, I think now that you've <laughs> It could be. <laughs> that, is, that is an interesting question. <laughs> um, I did skip over it when I saw those changes, but I, I think it's normal. Okay, okay, yeah, no, that, um, that is absolutely fair enough. Um, okay, so yeah, great description. You're absolutely right. Um, in terms of the most permanent findings here, we have got this very clearly marginated, mineralized, crescent shaped structure just cranial to the greater tubercle of the left humerus, um, and that is exactly where we'd expect the supraspinatus tendon to insert. Um, the supraspinatus tendon is going to come um, from the uh, scapula and it's going to insert just on the greater tubercle just here. Um, so um, that's exactly where big enthesiophytes might be if this patient had a chronic um, insertion or enthesiopathy affecting its left supraspinatus tendon. And uh, not only that, but as Giorgio has um, described, there's another clearly marginated um, roughly rectangular shape mineralized opacity and that's superimposed over the greater tubercle between the greater and lesser tubercles within the bicipital groove and the biceps tendon um, originates um, from the um, superior tubercle here and that's going to extend uh, distally and through the, the intertubercular groove between the greater and lesser tubercles of the humerus. Um, so this crescent-shaped mineralized structure is um, more likely to be associated with the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. And as Georgie pointed out, this uh, more opaque, more uh, mineralized um, this structure that looks like it's more dense uh, is, is maybe more likely to be associated with the biceps tendon. So I absolutely agree um, with uh, all of the uh, description there. Um, in terms of the right, the, the only feature that um, caught my eye slightly is, is that if, if this patient does have um, pathology affecting both its supraspinatus and its biceps tendon on the left, then it's not beyond the realm's possibility that it might have some sort of pathology affecting its supraspinatus and biceps tendon on the right. And, and I, I certainly couldn't make out any sort of aberrant mineralization associated with that greater tubercle, but the intertubercular groove, I just wonder whether it's just a little patchy increase in opacity there that might represent just a very early um, enthesiopathy mineralization affecting um, the right biceps tendon, but um, I wasn't so sure about it that I would say that there's definitely evidence of right, chronic right bicipital tenosynovitis um, in this radiograph. Um, so yeah, uh, nice job. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to skip across this because we have already talked about it. And uh, this isn't the same dog. Um, so this is, uh, this is a different dog um, that has uh, the same sort of lesion. So this is another greyhound um, actually presented for a very different reason. So presented because it actually had um, a facial swelling, um, but presented around about the same time as I was looking at the previous set of radiographs. And um, I thought it was um, quite helpful of this patient to have a similar lesion affecting its left shoulder. So this is a 
it's a seven millimeter bone reconstruction um, of the shoulders in this dog. Um, it's, it's taken as part of a much larger study, um, but I just quite like you guys to, uh, to keep an eye on the left shoulder, just uh, see what this looks like on CT. This is, this is going pretty quick, so I'm gonna slow that down and just move it forward a little bit more slowly. So I'm gonna stop it there. I'm gonna see if I can get my laser pointer back, which is there. So um, this is this is our left humerus here, and this is um, the greater tubercle here. Um, and hopefully you guys can appreciate that there are multiple clearly marginated, minimalized structures um, within the uh, supraspinatus tendon, just as it inserts on that greater tubercle. So, so this structure here is the supraspinatus tendon, and it's terminating here at the greater tubercle. And just at the point where it's terminating, we've got these, these big, clearly marginated, minimalized structures that represent enthesiophytes. And those are the sorts of structures that we can see in the previous set of shoulder radiographs. Like I say, this, this isn't the same dog. This is a different dog that has, has a very similar lesion. If we just run it forward a little bit more, then I'm gonna go back. Hopefully you guys can appreciate that. There is a little tiny bit of mineralization in this dog's bicep tendon as well. It's, it's way more subtle than the large enthesiophytes that we can see at the, at the insertion of that left supraspinatus tendon, but, but it is there. Um, so this dog also has a really severe uh, it's chronic insertion of enthesiopathy of its left supraspinatus, and it has um, some subtle mineralization of the left bicipital tendon sheath. So it has um, a chronic um, bicipital tenosynovitis, which um, has, has caused this, this mineralization. So this, uh, this greyhound as well had um, very similar lesions to the one that we just looked at in the previous set of films. So hopefully looking at the CT makes it a little easier for you guys to get your head around exactly what we're looking at in the radiographs when, um, we look, when we've, we've noticed those abnormal mineralized structures. So again, that's, those are the big enthesiophytes at the insertion of the left supraspinatus at the level of the greater tubercle. Some subtle mineralization of the bicipital tendon sheath on the left there. And then if you guys just want to cast your eyes to the right shoulder and you can see that that there are a few tiny little enthesiophytes just at the insertion of the right supraspinatus tendon as well just just adjacent to that greater tubercle so this this patient has bilateral disease and it's, it's just way more severe on the left than it is on the right and that's how it looks on ct um, and hopefully that makes it easier for you to uh, understand exactly what's going on in the radiographs and, and why we're seeing what we're seeing and why we're making the conclusions that we're making. Um, so yeah, nice job. Okay, any of you guys have any questions about case number one? Because if not, we will move straight on to case number two, which is a little different. So this is a seven-year-old male neutered domestic short hair cat and presented to you as um, straining to urinate. Um, I believe you guys have two radiographs. You've got a, uh, it's probably a right lateral abdominal radiograph and we're centered quite caudal. Um, so we've included um, the bladder neck um, and also um, the perineal area as well. And then we've got a single radiograph, which is a retrograde urethrogram. And we've got a bit of cystogram in there as well, but uh, the main reason for uh, doing this study is to evaluate the uh, urethra. So yeah, something a little bit different. Okay, so who fancies having a go at case number two? And there aren't too many of you guys. Um, so given that uh, Giorgio has already done case number one, I guess he's off the hook for this case. Um, so uh, we've got uh, Eva and we've got Luke. Um, I know that Luke is, is probably familiar with this case. But Hi. We've got Eva. Yeah, Eva, would you be happy to um, have a crack at this one? Yes, I'm just sorry if I don't, if I'm not very good. <laughs> no, no, this, um, this is, this is, as I said, this is, um, this is all about learning. So this cat um, has long since uh, been into the clinic, um, been diagnosed, been treated, and is currently at home, happy as Larry. Um, it's not an yes. exam, so there's absolutely no pressure. Perfect. 
Um, so we have a radiographic study of a skeletal immature cat, including lateral views of the caudal abdomen. Uh, the findings are a mineral opacity structure, irregularly shaped and well-defined borders in the area of uh, the projection of the penile urethra. Yep. Um, uh, there is good serosal detail of the abdominal organs. I didn't find any abnormalities there. And then in the second radiograph, the bladder and the urethral tract are highlighted by a mineral opacity compa compatible with contrast enhancement, uh, as you said, for the retrograde urethrograph urethrography. Yeah. And I think that it, there may be a filling defect in the beginning of the pelvic urethra. Um, so I think these findings are compatible with uh, urethral calculi in the penal urethra, possibly in the proposed to the bladder okay. by the urethrography. And then possibly a second calculi uh, that is not radiopaque in the pelvic urethra. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Yeah, good, um, good job. Um, so hopefully the rest of you guys can appreciate um, uh, all of uh, that radiostrition, which I, I absolutely agree with. So uh, in, in this plain radiograph, uh, we have got um, this quite large, clearly marginated, mineralized structure, um, just at the level of the uh, perineum, um, just caudal and ventral to um, the uh, pelvis in this cat. And, and that is a bit of a worry, given that this cat has presented as straining to urinate. Um, so first thoughts should be that this could represent um, a, a urethral lift um, lodged uh, within the penis. And we've got this retrograde urethra gland. Um, now, one of the things that I found kind of confusing about um, this case is that um, we've got this uh, mineralized structure um, just here. If it is a urethra width, then it's pretty caudal, so it's going to be close to the tip of the penis at this stage. And in this retrograde urethra gland, um, if this is a urethra width um, that's lodged in the tip of the penis, um, then really we'd expect to see um, a, a quite obvious filling defect at that level, um, so close to the tip of the penis. Now, I absolutely agree that there is the suggestion there could be a filling defect just here. Um, it isn't really the same size or shape as this mineralized structure that we've picked up in the plane radiograph, um, but certainly that um, could represent something that is intraluminal. Um, it could represent um, a, a smaller urethralith um, or sediment um, or a blood clot um, within that uh, urethral lumen and might be contributing to this patient's presenting clinical signs, um, so the strong urea. But um, I thought it was kind of curious um, that I wasn't seeing a filling defect um, e equivalent in shape and size to this mineralized structure that we've seen on the plane radiograph. Um, now, uh, you've you've already suggested a potential reason for that, um, and uh, if if I understood your description correctly, what you're suggesting is that this this could represent a urethralith at the tip of the penis, and um, the retrograde urethrogram has uh, not only given us more diagnostic information, but um, it's it's been partially therapeutic here in that um, it's retropulsed that urethral lift that was at the tip of the penis all the way back into the bladder. Um, and I think that's um, a, an excellent possible explanation for uh, why it's difficult to see a filling, an intraluminal filling defect in this retrograde urethrogram. Um, so I mean, the only other thing that I was going to ask you guys is, is, I mean, is there anything else that you might consider that, that this could be? Or are you guys absolutely certain that this is a urethral lift that is at the tip of the penis and it's been retropulsed um, back into the lumen of the urinary bladder by this retrograde urethrogram. Is there, is there anything else that you might consider that this could be? And that's an open question to, to the floor. So any, any of you guys have any other suggestions? I'm not saying that it's not uh, urethral lift, um, but is there anything else that you might even consider that it might be? This one. So the only thing that, that crossed my mind here is whether or not this could be an os penis. Now, the os penis you don't always see in a cat, but um, it is visible in about a third of patients using CR radiographic technique. And if it is an os penis, then it would be quite a big one. So they're not usually this chunky and 
this really opaque. But it's in about the right place for an os penis. And if there was an os penis, then that might explain why we're not really able to see it in the retrograde urethrogram. And um, it, 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 it might explain um, why there's no filling defect. And it would be another potential reason to, to, that would allow us to fit all of these radiographic changes together. So one of the reasons why I included this study um, was just to make you guys aware that um, cats do have um, an os penis. Um, you don't always see it. In fact, you only see it in about a third of patients um, using um, standard CR radiography. And you shouldn't mistake it for a urethralith. So you're much more likely to mistake an os penis for a urethralith rather than a urethralith for um, an os penis. Um, and um, I, I actually agree with Eva. I think it's it's more likely, given the opacity and the size and the shape of this structure, that it is a urethralith rather than an os penis. And um, I absolutely agree that the best way to explain the absence of an intraluminal filling defect in the contrast study is that it's been flushed into the bladder. But um, it's just to make you guys aware that um, an os, a feline os penis exists, and you can see it in about a third of cats. And if any of you guys are interested in reading the paper that gives you that information. It was a paper that appeared in VRU back in 2011 by Piola et al. Um, and that uh, goes through um, a whole bunch of radiographs and evaluates um, how, how often and how easy it was to see it. And essentially the bottom line is it's in about a third of cats. So um, I really like your theory of this urethralith getting flushed back into the urinary bladder during the retrograde. Um, and uh, what we did to try and confirm that was to just stick the probe on the cat, essentially, and see if we could see a urethralith and a systolith. And the answer was we absolutely could. So this is um, an ultrasound image. Um, this is taken using a linear high frequency probe. And the probe here is positioned um, quite caudal on the abdomen. And what we're looking at here is this is, this is the trigone of the urinary bladder. Uh, and this is the urethra here. And we've got this small, clearly marginated, hyper-echoic structure with um, some associated acoustic shadowing just sitting in the urethral lumen, just caudal um, to the trigone. And that's essentially the structure that we could see in the plain radiograph right at the start of our study. And, and this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So this, this structure was extremely mobile. So during the ultrasound scan, um, I could actually see the structure jumping from the urethra into the bladder and, and vice versa. So this, this systolith, urethralith, depending on where it was, was um, really mobile and was jumping between the bladder and the urethra. And as, as Eva suggested, what's happened here is that this, this structure at this point is lodged in the urethral lumen at the tip of the penis. And we've done a retrograde study and pushed it into the urinary bladder. I'm not really convinced we, we can see it here. We haven't really got sufficient filling of the urinary bladder lumen for us to be confident about exactly where it is. I think um, some of these more radiolucent areas within the urinary bladder lumen probably represent air bubbles and, and, and just as a result of insufficient filling. If it's this one here, that could be it. But with, with no sort of confidence, can we say that it's possible to, to see that stone in the urinary bladder? At least it's that, it's that. But with the ultrasound, you can absolutely see it in the lumen of the urethra. Um, you can absolutely see it um, in the lumen of the urinary bladder. So a beautiful picture there. There's no mistaking that that is a system. Of, um, so yeah, nice job, Eva. So this one I thought was a really nice study because um, I haven't seen too many um, retrograde uh, urethrograms that have also been therapeutic. So most of the uh, retrograde urethrograms or retrograde urethrocysticograms that I've done, um, if you can see the, um, the urethralith um, or the, the systoliths on the plane radiograph, usually they kind of stay put and you can make them out as filling defects um, uh, in the contrast study. But in this study, um, we can see the lesion, we can see the lith in the plane radiograph quite uh, easily, but then we can't really see it 
in the retrograde. And um, it, it, it can be quite tricky to work out why that is. Well, why isn't there a filling defect there? And, and the answer is, well, you can't see the filling defect because it's not there anymore because you've actually pushed it back into the urinary bladder during the retrograde study. Um, and that, that can sometimes be very confusing, particularly if you're then trying to work out whether or not the structure that you thought was a lift could actually be an os penis and that might explain why you can't see the structure in the retrograde study. Um, so yeah, I think um, Eva did an, an excellent job there um, piecing it all together. Um, that was really, really good. So um, that's what a big uh, urethroth looks like on a plain radiograph, if it's lodged at the tip of the penis. Um, I suppose the, the other thing to say about this radiographic study is if, if you are taking the radiograph of a patient that you think might have systolates and might have urethralis, then make sure you extend the cord ledge of collimation to um, include the perineal area because there, there could be liths lodged um, in the tip of the penis. Um, and for these sort of radiographs in, in cats, you don't necessarily need to pull the hind limbs cranially. So in dogs, if you think about where the penis is in dogs, it, it, it kind of comes right the way around here. So it, it's often useful to pull the hind limbs um, cranially um, to try and um, get a better view of that urethra. But, but the urethra in, in the cat is, is going to be here. So you don't necessarily have to pull those hind limbs forward. You can just have it in a neutral position, but you should still be able to see um, anything that's going on in that um, intrapelvic urethra. Um, so yeah, nice job. Okay, any questions about case number two? You guys all happy. In which case, we will move on to case number three, uh, which is another young dog. So this is a two-year-old male neutered Cocker Spaniel, and um, this dog presents to you um, lame on the left four. So this is uh, another orthopedic case. Um, so we've got mediolateral and craniocaudal views of the left elbow and mediolateral and craniocaudal views of the right elbow. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, any of you guys except Eva are probably up because Eva's now off the hook because she did such an excellent job with case number two. So, um, which of you guys fancies taking on case number three? There's not too many to choose from, so essentially it's, <laughs> it's Georgia again or, or Luke. Either of you guys fancy, tell me what you make of this dog's elbows. I could potentially run through it, but the problem with that is I already know what the answer is. I mean, Eva could have another go if uh, yeah, feeling I can, but, Yeah, um, go for it. I'm not, I'm not very confident, but... No, you did, you, did a, you did a fabulous job of case number two, so um, I think you've got every reason to be confident. <laughs> Let's go. We have a radiographic study of a skeletally mature dog, including craniocardial and mediolateral views of the left and right elbow. The findings are uh, in the craniocardial view in the left elbow joint, there is a, well, I think there is a moderate lateral displacement of the radial head in relation to the lateral humeral condyle. Um, and this, there is a uh, widened joint surface area. And I think there is a mid-lateral displacement of the right radial head in relation with the right lateral humeral condyle. Okay. There is also a possible small radiolucency area in the left humeral intercondylar area. Okay, yeah. And I think there is a radiolucency in the left lateral humeral condyle cortex and left radial head, but the exposure parameters of this view are different from the right view and may be misleading in comparison. Okay. Yeah. And my conclusions are possible humeral intracondylar fissure and yeah. possible subluxation of the left elbow joint. Okay. Yeah. No. I. Uh, I yeah. I like that. That's uh, that's all good. Um. So, uh, you other guys. So, uh, Giorgio um, and Luke, you guys have anything to add? Are you happy with with that description? Yeah. I mean, I, I struggled with these ones. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's all right. So um, I, I absolutely agree, particularly with um, this possible sagittal fissure um, that's bisecting that uh, left humeral condyle. Um, and, and I do agree that um, it does look like the um, humeroidal joint space is a little bit wider on the left um, than it is on the right. Um, and I do agree that the 
radiopacity or radiolucency of the humeral condyle and the radius is um, a little different on the left compared to the right. But as you, as you pointed out, um, the exposure is different um, for the right relative to the left. So it's very difficult to um, be confident um, about whether that represents um, a real change and represents real pathology um, or whether um, it's just down to the exposure. Um, in, in terms of uh, how likely it is that there's a luxation, I mean, the medial lateral views look pretty good uh, in terms of the um, joint spaces and the apposition of the radius relative to the humerus and the radius relative to the ulna. Um, so I'm more inclined to believe that the uh, discrepancy in the size of the joint spaces between the right and the left is positional due to exposure factors rather than um, it represents a genuine subluxation. Um, the only other thing is that this dog has, doesn't have any history of trauma. I didn't actually tell you its history. So it, it, it didn't have any history of trauma, this dog. It just had a chronic intermittent left fallen lameness. Um, so um, you know, it hadn't had a fall, it hadn't been hit by a car, I mean, it hadn't had anything happen to it that um, might uh, luxate um, its elbow. Um, so I think um, the uh, lesions that you described that, um, might suggest that there's maybe an OCD here. So OCD in the elbow, it, it tends to be the um, medial aspect of the humeral condyle that's um, affected. And um, if there were OCD here, then we'd expect to see um, a crescent or plate-shaped um, radio, radiolucency that was contiguous with the um, articular surface here um, at the trochlea, and we'd expect to see some subchondral bone sclerosis um, associated with it as well, um, and maybe even um, some um, little joint mice. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced we can see anything like that um, on these radiographs, but um, I am really happy that you uh, spotted and you've very nicely described this um, sagittal uh, fissure that looks like it's running right the way down the humeral condyle. And in a dog like this, this is a young dog, it's a spaniel. Um, so uh, spaniel breeds um, are predisposed to um, incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle. Um, I mean, this dog is two years old and uh, the humeral condyle um, should have fused. So the humeral condyle forms from two separate ossification centers that usually fuse at about 80 days after birth. So this dog is well beyond that. It's, it's two years old, this dog. So um, these, these separate centers of ossification here should have fused a long time ago. The other thing, though, is, is that incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle is usually something that is bilateral. Um, so it's usually something that affects both elbows. And we're not really able to, to see it um, in this right elbow. Now, um, this, the, the positioning here on this right craniocaudal radiograph isn't quite as good as the left, so it's a little bit oblique. And um, in order to see these really subtle fissures on elbow radiographs, um, you really do need a straight uh, elbow um, in order for um, the primary beam to hit that fracture line, or fracture line, or fissure line, um, and make it visible. If you're a little bit oblique, then that can make it much harder to spot. So it could be that, that there is a, a fissure here, but we just can't really see it because of the level of obliquity. Um, either way, um, I think your suggestion of incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle is a good one, um, and that is um, definitely something that I would be chasing here. Um, so, uh, what would be your recommendation, either, for this patient? A CT scan? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think um, a CT uh, would be a good way of um, looking at this left humeral condyle in a little bit more detail, and also um, evaluating the right humeral condyle just to see if there's anything um, sinister lurking there. We're not able to see on these radiographs. So that's what we did. So let's take a look at CT. It was the same dog. I was going to play it. I'm going to run it, run it through and see what these numbers look like. All right, so let's stop it at uh, the best point. So we'll stop it there. All right, um, so this is get the laser pointer there. All right, so this is this is our left humeral condyle, and in the CT, and this is against a submillimeter, so it's a 0.6 millimeter bone reconstruction of um, both of these elbows. And in the CT, there's absolutely no doubt that there is a, a sagittal fissure bisecting that left humeral condyle, and um, it's contiguous with the articular surface um, because if we look at the uh, articular surface of the humeral ulna joint there. It, the articular margins of that humeral condyle are discontinuous and that extends proximally right up to the supratrochlear foramen. Um, 
Um, so that is absolutely where we'd expect to see a fissure if um, this was an incompletely ossified humeral condyle. Um, and that is exactly what this is. Um, so yeah, good job, Eva. Um, in terms of other changes here, um, I think there is a little bit of uh, sclerosis of the adjacent bone. So I think uh, just looking at the bone next to this sagittal fissure, um, we're losing a little bit of the normal trabecular bone detail. It's a little bit more hyperechoic. Um, so there is some associated sclerosis. Um, so let's just go back to a normal pointer so I can scroll through this. So let's keep an eye on that left humeral condyle. We can see there's, there's our big fissure. It goes right the way from the articular surface, right the way up to the supratrocular frame. And there's a little bit of sclerosis associated with it. It doesn't look like there's any associated uh, fractures. So the worry with these patients, of course, is that because that humeral condyle isn't fused, um, that they're predisposed to uh, condylar fractures. And um, from an orthopedic surgeon standpoint, um, it's much easier to um, stick a big screw across a humeral condyle that has a fissure in it, rather than have to reconstruct a elbow with a complicated uh, comminuted lateral condylar fracture. So it's really important that these get picked up early uh, before the patient goes on to develop any complications um, like lateral condylar fractures. So we can take a look at the right one as well. And, and actually the right humeral condyle looks okay. So this, this does kind of look like it's intact. So I, I don't really see a fissure there. Um, I don't really even see any sclerosis there. Um, in, in fact, you know, we're seeing pretty normal trabecular bone detail throughout that right humeral condyle. Um, so even though this is a condition that, that is normally bilateral, um, I'm not convinced that, that I can see a um, fissure there affecting that humeral condyle. Um, so um, diagnosis here is, as far as we can tell, um, a unilateral incomplete ossification of the left humeral condyle. And the recommendation, recommendation would certainly be surgical consultation with a view to stabilizing this humeral condyle. Um, the reason why I've included this one is it's nice to be able to see the radiographs and see the subsequent CT scan. Um, so um, you can um, be more confident about diagnosing this in the future. So it was absolutely possible to see this um, just using the radiographs, um, as, as Eva's just demonstrated, um, and um, completely vindicated by the CT scan. So um, that, that subtle little fissure that um, is quite difficult to see on the radiographs, that is absolutely there. It is absolutely real. Um, and this patient definitely does have incomplete ossification of its humeral condyle. Now, the only other thing that I mentioned here is that because this condition is um, really often bilateral, we need to be really cautious about saying that that right humeral condyle is, is completely normal because CT isn't um, the, the most um, sort of sensitive or specific for picking up changes within uh, humeral condyles that are affected by this condition. And um, there was a paper by, funnily enough, the same author um, that wrote the paper about the feline os penis um, back in 2012 that looks at the MR features of canine incomplete um, humeral condyle ossification. And um, what they found was that in some dogs that didn't have any changes visible on uh, CT, there was some evidence of um, hyper intensity on the stir sequences on MR. And in at least one of the dogs that they looked at during um, that study, that dog that had, um, I think they were radiographs actually, pretty normal looking radiographs, but then had um, high, a hyper intensity within the presumed unaffected humeral condyle on the MRI, went on to develop a fissure um, and then a fracture. So um, it's just to say that if you want to be absolutely sure that there are no pathological changes affecting this right humeral condyle, then um, you might consider putting this patient through the MR to look for any evidence of inflammation in the bone in that humeral condyle using the stow sequences. Um, alternatively, I think there are orthopedic surgeons out there that might be inclined to just stick a screw across this condyle anyway, um, but that would be absolutely up to the orthopedic surgeon that was, was treating this case. Um, so yeah, this was um, a really nice case of um, incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle. Um, and yeah, he did a really good job of spotting it um, and describing it and uh, making the diagnosis. So yeah, nice job either. All right, so that brings us on to our final case of the evening, which is something a little different. So this is 
Um, again, a young patient, so this is a two-year-old female neutered round doll cat um, that has presented with um, chronic vomiting. So, who fancies taking a crack at these radiographs? So we've got a thoracic series here, essentially. So we've got a DV thorax, a right lateral thorax, and a left lateral thorax. This is a young young cat, uh, chronic intermittent vomiting. Whereas I can't have either D three, so I'll just... <laughs> yeah, no worries. I mean, this is a bit different. So this is, um, yeah, this is the first, the first thoracic, first thoracic case of the evening, except the uh, except the example, which is surprising because I, I usually quite like to include lots of thoracic cases, but this is this is the first one um, for this evening's session. So yeah, go for it. Okay, so my, I mean, I, I was I was looking at the laterals, and I think my eyes were drawn to the abdomen. So I'm kind of regretting volunteering for it now, but I'll. Uh, I'll try not to be persuaded by that. Um, <laughs> so, um, in the um, DV, um, I felt as though there was um, kind of multiple um, small focal um, gravelly structures. Um, I think the uh, gastro loop is the transverse colon, um, and kind of within that, I think it's a tissue loop of small bowel. Um, I think there's a soft tissue structure within the pylorus, which is not visible on the left lateral, but I don't think that suggests any sort of obstruction. Um, on the laterals, I, I thought the serosal detail were, was good. Um, and, and I think there was a of um, gas-filled small bowel. Um, and you can see those um, small focal areas that look intramural luminal. Um, I thought that re represented a gravel, uh, a gravel sign, sorry, that um, would indicate a partial obstruction that's chronic yeah. um, and I feel as though the distended bowel in the um, right lateral is again the um, transverse colon with heterogeneous material within it. Yeah. Um, I did skip over the thorax so I'm kind of looking over it now but <laughs> that's the case I'm really worried I'm missing something. Um, but that, that was my honest opinion I thought I thought it was a gravel sign and partial obstruction. Okay, no, that's um, that's fine. Um, anybody else have anything to uh, add? Anything else about these radiographs that they were concerned about? Just before um, we go through. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments? Um, I mean, I could um, maybe just comment a little bit on on Georgia's description. So. Um, so a gravel sign, uh, as you said, is um, usually as a result of a partial obstruction of, of the small bowel. Um, so uh, because there's um, usually narrowing of the lumen, um, all of the larger, more dense particulate ingester gets stuck or rad to whatever it is that's causing that partial obstruction. And that usually manifests as um, segmental dilatation of the small bowel with the most dependent part of that uh, segmental dilatation filled with um, mineralized debris. Um, that's that's sort of the classic uh, gravel sign. And um, gravel signs, uh, in my experience, you usually see them in, in, in older animals and usually as a result of something chronic um, like um, an intestinal mass. Um, so, um, dogs and cats with intestinal tumours that are gradually getting bigger and making the lumen more and more uh, stenotic. Um, they'll gradually develop this um, obstruction and over time you'll get this uh, large particulate um, dense mineralized debris accumulate um, or add um, to the lesion. Now uh, this, this is quite, it's a young, it's a young cat. Um, Nothing to say that it can't have uh, chronic obstruction, and I mean, it could be that this patient has a foreign body and um, it's been stuck there for ages, and as a result of that, um, it's got a chronic uh, obstruction, a partial obstruction of the small bowel. Um, so, so here we've got uh, the uh, lumen. Um, so this is a DV view, so the gas in the stomach would expect to be um, in the fundus um, rather than the antrum, so this is this is fundus here. Um, I, I do kind of, so I agree that there is something here that looks a little bit abnormal. So we've got um, a, a clearly marginated, uh, roughly ovoid soft tissue opaque structure just superimposed on the gas that's within the gastric lumen here. So that there is something there that is, is a little bit of a worry, but the stomach isn't particularly big um, and 
Um, if this is something that we need to worry about, then um, it's it's certainly not stuck in the pylorus because as you um, described um, in the left lateral view, um, all the gas is going to go to the non-dependent part of the abdomen, so it's going to go into the pylorus. It's going to highlight um, any foreign bodies that might be stuck um, in the pylorus, um, so it's a super useful view to uh, acquire um, in patients where you suspect they might have a gastric foreign body or a gastric outflow obstruction because it's going to push all the gas around that foreign body that's stuck in the pylorus and make it much easier to see. But here I think this is this is probably gas in the pylorus. There's probably a pylorus there. There's probably the duodenum there. And there's nothing stuck in there. But we have got this, this big loop of, of bowel here that's full of um, quite opaque, quite heterogeneous material. Um, but, but as you said, that's, that's probably going to be colon. Um, so this looks really like fecal material here. Um, so this is this probably large bowel. So I suspect that this this bit of bowel here is also probably large bowel. Um, we do have gas within um, the small bowel, um, but as far as we can tell, um, there is just a single population of small bowel that's filled with gas. And if, if we're going to go down the route of, uh, I think this cat's obstructed, then we'd need to see two distinct populations of, of small bowel. So we've got what we think is a big bit of large bowel that's that's full of poop, and it's relatively normal looking poop, and then a single population of gas filled, but not necessarily dilated, small bowel, um, but it's in a pretty normal location, so it's in the mid-abdomen and it's ventrally positioned. So I'm not, I'm not too concerned about um, this single population of small bowel. I do agree that um, it does contain gas, but it, it, we're not really seeing a big differential between two different populations of small bowel here. We've got large bowel that's filled with feces, we've got small bowel that's filled with gas. Um, and we can't say for sure that this cat's not obstructed because we haven't included the whole abdomen. Um, but my index of suspicion is not too high. Um, this, I mean, I, what I can say at this point is that this, this I did uh, ultrasound this cat's abdomen uh, shortly after these radiographs were taken. And this cat did, did actually have a hay wall um, in its stomach, um, which was subsequently removed via endoscopy. And I suspect that that's what, that's what this thing is. So I think that's, that's a hay ball there. That's the hay ball that we could see on ultrasound. Um, but I'm not convinced there's any sort of obstruction. Um, so there is, there is something else going on here um, that we should uh, be mindful of. Um, so any of you guys feel like you can see something else in this thorax that we should be a little bit concerned about? Hi, I just feel bad because I've been talking the whole... The no, that's okay. No, that's good. This, this is what we want. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. Uh, yes, um, what, what, what do you reckon? Well, I mean, we do, we have the endotracheal tube, which I thought we might mention. I think there is dilation of the thoracic esophagus with tracheal strips signed in the craniodorsal part of the thorax. Um, I think there is a diffuse increase in lung opacity. I think it's bronchiointerstitial pattern diffusely yeah. in all the lung lobes. And I think there is a focal structure of increased uh, soft tissue radio opacity surrounded at the level of the cranial thorax in the third intercostal space. Uh, you can see better in the right lateral view and also um, you can correlate it uh, in the in the dorsal ventral view in the area of projector or projection of the cranial part of the left cranial lung lobe. And I think there is also kind of blurring of the outline of the cardiac silhouette uh, in the dorsal ventral view. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So, what do you think that means? Well, that's a nice radiograph description. But um, what would you conclude in terms of what does all that mean? I'm not sure at all. I think. <laughs> It could be, I don't think this is it, to be honest, but the differential I got was esophageal stricture or diverticulum or, and then secondary or um, esophagus to the anesthetic or, or primary uh, foreign body. But okay. yeah, I, I have to say I'm not sure, sorry. Okay. No, no, um, but nice description. And um, yeah, I mean, tricky sort of thoracic radiographs to interpret, but you're absolutely right. This, this esophagus uh, is too big um, and it's too big in all of these views. Um, so um, in this right lateral view, we, we can see the, the dorsal border and the ventral border of the mid uh, caudal thoracic esophagus. Um, and we can see uh, the uh, esophagus just caudal to the thoracic inlet. And what's kind of weird about it is that there is generalized dilatation of the esophagus with gas here. 
Um, but uh, there is this little area at the level of the third intercostal space where it almost looks like the uh, esophageal lumen is, is kind of pinched. So there's quite abrupt narrowing of the lumen of the esophagus at the third intercostal space. And now in the patient, uh, a young patient that's presented with chronic intermittent vomiting, um, then that, that should um, spark uh, a few ideas about what the possible differentials might be. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, because this patient is anesthetized, then we might expect to see um, a megaesophagus, an iatrogenic megaesophagus in this patient. Um, and it would be impossible to tell if it was genuine or whether it was just caused by the anesthetic. Um, but, but we wouldn't expect to see this, this abrupt tapering of the lumen um, here, uh, the cranial thoracic esophagus at the level of the third intercostal space. And we can see it in um, this left lateral view too. So we can see that we've got um, quite marked segmental dilatation of the cranial thoracic esophagus. We've then got, um, so that again, a, a portion where we're struggling to see the esophageal lumen. So we've got um, sort of the segmental dilatation of the cranial thoracic esophagus. We've got an area that just looks uniformly opaque and has a soft tissue opacity. And then we can pick up the margins of the lumen of the mid and caudal thoracic esophagus, um, just caudal to it. So again, it, it sort of suggests there's something going on here. Um, there, there's some narrowing or um, it, it's probably not an esophageal farm body because if you're an esophageal farm body, then we'd really expect to be able to see it. Um, so I mean, most esophageal farm bodies, um, or even those that, that aren't particularly radiopaque like, like bone, um, you would still expect to see um, an increase in the opacity, you'd expect to see an abnormal structure in that region. Um, it doesn't really look like an esophageal farm body. Plus, it can be weird um, to have such marked dilatation of the caudal esophagus relative to the area that we think might be narrowed, stenosed, obstructed by an esophageal farm body. So it, that, that kind of seems um, less likely. Um, we can see it on the on the DV as well. It, it is it is harder to see, but but we've got big dilated esophagus here. We've got sort of something here where it looks like it's a little bit discontinuous. And then we can see the esophageal walls here um, representing a big dilated esophagus. So there's definitely something going on um, with, with this um, esophagus. And um, it certainly might be contributing to this patient's presented clinical signs, so the chronic intermittent vomiting. Um, so what we're going to do before we talk any more about what this might be is just take a look at the endoscopy. Um, so um, this cat uh, did have um, an endoscopic study. Um, so this is uh, Hannah, our medic, who's driving the scope. Um, and I'll do my best to talk you through what's going on here. So, so this is this is the point of the esophagus that is very narrowed. So this is the esophagus of the third intercostal space. It's that area that looks very narrowed on the radiographs and that looks more radiopaque. And Hannah here is just trying to get the scope through it to look at the esophagus beyond it. And beyond it, the esophagus looks absolutely normal. So that's what the esophagus should look like. I and mean, it should be as wide as that and, and as clear as that. And if we go back and take a look at this again, at the level of that third intercostal space, it, it really isn't. It really looks really narrow. It almost kind of looks like something is squashing it. Um, so there's maybe a, an extra luminal structure that's pushing on it and making the luminal that esophagus much narrower um, at that point. Um, and certainly if that esophagus is, is narrowed, if there's a focal narrowing of that esophagus um, within the cranial thorax, that might absolutely be um, causing this cat some problems um, and, and contributing to its chronic intermittent illness. Um, so and my question to you guys now is what are our differentials here? Um, so having seen the radiographs and having had a chat about them and, and then having seen the endoscopy, um, what sort of things do you think we should consider in this cat? It's quite a young cat as well. Any ideas? And we've said that a esophageal foreign body is, is unlikely, particularly given, that we, particularly given that we've scoped it now. And there's definitely not an esophageal foreign body. If we're thinking something extra luminal, um, some sort of mediastinal structure pushing on on it, like a, yeah. you know, someone's just put, someone's just put in the chat a vessel. Oh yeah, is there a, sorry, oh, yeah, I almost forget to check the chat. I'll steal that idea. <laughs> something like a granuloma. Uh yeah. Or an abscess. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so if if this were a mediastinal mass, 
and and you can absolutely get mediastinal masses in in young patients. So, um, like a paraesophageal abscess, um, we, we'd really expect to see some some sort of um, increase in opacity. We'd expect to see uh, some sort of space occupying lesion um, in the mediastinum. Um, and and I, I don't think we can. I mean, the mediastinum looks kind of wide because the esophagus is really big, but we're not really seeing any soft tissue opaque structure, um, just cranial to the heart in this DVD. Um, we can't really convince ourselves that there's, there's a mediastinal mass in these lateral views either. I, I do kind of agree that um, there might be a little bit of increase in, in increased opacity in this craniometral thorax here, but it, it's difficult to know if that's lung or if if that's part of the soft tissues of the forelimbs or whether this might represent material in the esophagus and mediastinal. Um, but no, I'm, I'm liking the idea of um, something mediastinal and uh, I'm also liking the idea that this could be something um, vascular. Um, so yeah, is, is there anything congenital and vascular that, that might do this? You guys are aware of. Yeah, a ring anomaly, yeah, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. But, so, yeah, no, go on. So you so, say, uh, wouldn't wouldn't we see that in much younger patients? No, I've I've I remember not at LVS, but in the the previous hospital where I worked, we had a, a dog present to medicine. The, I think it was six years old, and it had a history of chronic intermittent vomiting, and. Um, the radiographs didn't look unlike this, and I made the mistake of saying that there was no way that this dog could have a vascular ring anomaly because it was six years old, and then it had a CT and it had a vascular ring anomaly. <laughs> so, so we, we certainly can't rule that out um, based on the fact that this cat is is two years old. And, and for me, that would be um, probably top of my differentialist here that, that this cat has some sort of congenital vascular ring anomaly um, that is causing um, narrowing of the esophageal lumen. Um, at that point, so just cranial to the heart, um, and these radiographs at the level of further decostal space. So um, that that just um, stimulated me to um, just do a little bit of revision uh, in terms of the types of um, vascular ring anomalies that you can have, um, and there are a whole bunch of them. So there, there are seven of them. Um, most of them involve a persistent right or aortic arch. Um, so in, in dogs, this is much easier to see, but if you have um, a vascular ring anomaly that involves a persistent right aortic arch, which they normally do, then you see displacement of the trachea um, to the left. Uh, we can't really see that um, in this cat. Um, I think it's much harder to see that in cats. Um, there are a couple of other uh, vascular ring anomalies that, that don't involve um, persistent right aortic arches. So the aorta stays on the left, um, but you have other abnormal structures that uh, pass over the top of the esophagus and, and, and essentially squash it, causing narrowing of the lumen. Um, so uh, you can have um, a persistent, sorry, an, an aberrant right subclavian, um, or you can have um, a persistent right ligamentum arteriosum. So the ligament that uh, is between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, um, because of the uh, abnormal greater vessels, that ligament ends up squashing the esophagus um, and causing um, the sort of narrowing of the esophageal lumen that we're seeing in um, the endoscopic images that um, have a very kindly provided. Um, so, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm suspicious that this cat might have um, a congenital vascular ring anomaly. I can't tell you what sort um, because we would need to CT this cat in order to investigate it a little further and to work out um, where the aorta is, where the left and right subclavian arteries are, um, where the um, ligamentum arteriosum is, if there is one there and if it's visible, and essentially just work out what it is that's, that's squashing the esophagus at that level um, that we can see um, in this um, video of the endoscopy. Um, so yeah, and if, if we do end up CTing this cat, then um, I will share it with you guys. But at the moment, um, the cat's actually doing pretty well. Um, so funnily enough, uh, when we did the endoscopy, there was actually a hairball that was stuck, um, just just ORAD, so just cranial to the point of um, stricture. Um, so just, just, just cranial to where that esophagus was getting narrowed. There was a hairball stuck there within the esophageal lumen. And then when Hannah went down into the stomach, um, there was another hay ball in the stomach, which was the one that I picked up on ultrasound, um, and that got removed as well. And after removing both of those hay balls, actually, this patient's doing pretty well. Um, so um, there's no plans to CT it at the moment, um, but I think it would be an interesting one. Um, I think we would find some sort of congenital vascular. So yeah, nice job, team. So any questions about case number four? 
I have one. It's yeah. um, a bit stupid. It's, it's not the main problem of the card, but do you? Is it correct to say that the heart in the dorsal ventral looks a bit blurry, or is it not correct? Um, mm, is that I, yeah, I mean, I. So immediately you, you start to use, start to say, well, there's there's effacement of the margins of the cardiac silhouette. Um, you're going down the route for pleural effusion, essentially. So. Um, most of the time, if you have effacement of the margins of the diaphragm or the cardiac silhouette, um, then there's going to be some pleural effusion or there's some other soft tissue structure that is sitting just adjacent to it um, and um, has a similar opacity to the soft tissue of the heart or the liver. And so you can't see the boundaries between them. Um, in, in, in this camp, I, I think we, we can see the, the margins of the cardiac silhouette reasonably well. I, I do kind of agree that the on the left here, it is kind of hard to make it out, but I suspect that that's, that's because of the superimposition of the walls of the esophagus. Um, so I, I, I probably wouldn't have included that statement in my report. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that there was a face with the margins of the kind of this um, Mostly because I think it, it would just muddy the waters in terms of what the, the most pertinent radiographic changes are. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Because if there aren't, then we've run over slightly, um, but that's okay. And uh, yeah, it just remains for me to thank you guys for joining me this evening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, our four cases, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you again next month. And uh, there's not very much sunshine left of the evening <laughs> because I'm sitting in darkness now. Um, but what there is left of the evening, I hope you enjoy. Um, I hope to see you again next month. So thanks, guys. Um, I'll see you again later. So bye-bye. Bye, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, no worries. Bye-bye.